my pleasure to welcome you all today on behalf of the Uchai Initiative and Terry to the webinar on climate change and health risk. The topic for today is what medical students and health professionals need to know. Uchai Initiative brings together professionals, experts, organizations, and knowledge systems to address climate change and health risks in India. It is supported by the U.S. National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Before we begin the webinar today, we would like to request you to message to us any trouble you face with the audio or video reception. Should, should you have any questions for the panelists, please send these online. We would be requesting the panelists to respond to them towards the end of the webinar. Today we have with us Dr. Anand Krishnan, Professor, Center for Community Medicine, Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Anand also heads the WHO Collaborating Center for Capacity Development and Research in Community-Based Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Control. He is a recipient of several prestigious awards, including the BC Srivastava Award for Best Young Scientist in Community Medicine in 2000, the MK Shishari Award for Research in Community Medicine by the ICMR, PN Raju Oration Award by ICMR, and more recently, the Harcharan Singh Oration Award of the Indian Association of Preventive and Social Medicine. He is a member of National Steering Committee on Monitoring of National Program for Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Diseases, and Stroke. I know the program says to, it is for medical students and health professionals, but I'm sure there are a lot of others as well who have joined us today. I welcome all of you for, uh, and, and thank you for joining this webinar. We have an interesting discussion ahead uh, on climate change. In fact, Lancet called uh, climate change as perhaps the biggest global threat uh, of 21st century. In general, when we talk of climate change, we think of uh, rising seas and uh, that the sea coast and some island nations would uh, disappear because of rising seas. And we see that thing happening maybe in, in some decades ahead. We don't really perceive any imminent threat of uh, uh, climate change. We see that as a future threat and therefore do not really perceive that we should be doing something about it. And, and it, in general terms, we say that we should do something, but not really think of it as an immediate threat that for something that we need to take action now. But unfortunately, that perception is not true. Climate change is occurring now and the threat is now. As you will see in the presentations which will follow my introduction, Many of these health effects have started taking shape and we are being affected right now by uh, the change in climate. So the question is what should we, what do we expect medical students to do or health professionals to do? Isn't it something that the environmentalists and others should do? Obviously first and foremost the weather changes or climate would act through increase in mortality and ultimately that is something that the health system handles. It is the health system that ultimately is going to bear the burden due to the outcomes due to climate change of increase in the morbidity and mortality. So we are going to be the recipients of uh, end, end products, sufferers of this change. And therefore we should be a stakeholder and we should be doing something. Now also doctors and medical students are, and health professionals are important members of the community. They are a, uh, role models and they should by their own personal uh, belief and model as well as try to advocate around the, in the community for bringing up changes which are very useful for improving public health. And climate change is definitely one of the biggest threats facing the public health today, as you will see later on. So with that introduction, I would now request our uh, first speaker, who is Dr. Arindam Datta. He's a uh, fellow of Center for Environment Studies, Terry, which is organizing this webinar. His uh, research interests are global climate change, and his current emphasis on carbon and nitrogen cycling in soil and biosphere, atmosphere, trace gas exchange in ecosystems. His academic background is in environmental sciences, bio, uh, geochemistry, and climate change. I request Arindam to uh, make his presentation on critical climate science pathways that increase risks to health. Dr. Arindam Datta. Hi, I am Arindam Datta. I am working in the uh, Center for Environmental Studies at the Energy and Resources Institute, New Delhi. We all know about the, this uh, famous killing curve that uh, Dr. Keeling has started recording the ambient carbon dioxide concentration at the Manaloa Observatory during 1950. 
and the observation is still continuing. And the present ambient concentration of carbon dioxide shows that the level has already reached 410 ppm. Um, and it is increasing day after day. The present uh, ambient methane concentration at the same laboratory is 1845 ppb, that is around 1.84 uh, ppm, and it is increasing again day by day. These are the two major greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Apart from that, apart from this one, there are nitrous oxide uh, and other different uh, man-made greenhouse gases like CFG, ozone, uh, water vapor, etc. Uh, the global warming potential of methane is about 20 times higher than that of carbon dioxide, and for nitrous oxide, it is nearly 300 times, or uh, to, to be very specific, it is. 265 times higher than carbon dioxide. If we look at the greenhouse gas concern, greenhouse gases and how it is warming the earth surface, the greenhouse gases makes a layer over the uh, over the uh, earth surface. This is uh, the greenhouse gas layer. But the greenhouse gas is also necessary for our atmosphere. If the greenhouse gases is not there in the atmosphere, then all the outgoing infrared radiation will be lost in the space and uh, then the earth will be cooler and it will not be suitable for living. But when the concentration of these greenhouse gases increase in the atmosphere, the outgoing infrared radiation cannot escape into the space and it is getting trapped inside the earth's atmosphere and the earth's atmosphere is gradually getting warm. Um, there are uh, different orders of uh, effects of the greenhouse gases uh, or the climate change on the environment. The first order effect is a geophysical impact, that is the increase in the temperature or increase in the rainfall, something like that. And the second other uh, effect is the biophysical effect, that is uh, effect on the forest land, grassland, agricultural land, etc. Third order effect is the vector borne disease or heat stress or the disease related to human, human being. And the fourth order uh, impact is the socio-political impact. This is the uh, main uh, geophysical impact of the climate change, that is the increase in the temperature. In the first graph, we are showing that if the temperature of the uh, annual temperature is increasing, annual ambient temperature is increasing by changing the mean annual, uh, annual temperature, and uh, there is a uniform distribution. That means the distribution of temperature around the around the year is same, but overall temperature is increasing, then it is the situation as uh, depicted in uh, figure A. But if the um, temperature, mean temperature remains constant, but the um, uh, but uh, the temperature distribution throughout the year is shifting towards one side, mainly towards the hotter side, then the situation will be as depicted in uh, figure B. But if the mean temperature is sitting very high and with the changing in the temperature in different seasons, then the situation will be as in uh, as shown in the part C. But you can see in all the three graphs that the hot weather is increasing rather than increasing the cold weather. That is when the climate change is occurring or a hot weather event, so the um, uh, the increase in the temperature is increasing most rather than increasing the cold days. When the temperature increases in the earth surface, then um, the moisture holding capacity of the ambient air is also increases, and this one way increases the um, rainfall pattern also. This affects the rainfall pattern. This affects the monsoon and uh, with with higher temperature and with higher um, higher uh, relative humidity of a particular area, the extreme weather events uh, are also increasing. This graph shows how the precipitation is changing with the impact of the climate change. With the new climate, there there is a chance of less precipitation, but mostly there is a chance of high precipitation with the newer climate. But uh, there is no direct effect of uh, climate change on precipitation that has not yet been established. 
but uh, with the increase in the humidity uh, or the moisture holding capacity of the uh, ambient air with increasing temperature, the precipitation rate can increase. So here this slide shows uh, the impact of climate change on human health and uh, on different aspects. Like uh, main impact of the climate change is the rising in the temperature which affect which leads to different to extreme weather event or um, increase in the rainfall. Again, the glacier melting, it leads to the sea level rise. Uh, and these effects leads to extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, changes in the vector bull diseases, increase in the allergens, water quality impact, and water and food supply impact. And different impact of climate change is having different sorts of uh, effects on the human health. Like when the air pollution is happening, say there is an increase in temperature and this leads to uh, forest fire. And the forest fire emits a lot, lots of particulate matter in the atmosphere. So this uh, particulate matter can lead to asthma and different cardiovascular diseases. If there is a change in the vector board ecology, in the, in, the, in, uh, in some slides I will show that how the, uh, how the climate change affects the vector bone ecology. That vector bone diseases like malaria, dengue, encephalitis, all these things can increase with the, in, in, uh, with the climate change. And there are different allergens that can withstand in the atmosphere with the increase in the moisture content of the ambient air. There are different uh, effects of climate change on human health, some of the direct impact and some of the indirect impact. In the direct impact, there is heat stress. This is due to increase in temperature and there is death due to flood, drought or cyclone, etc. And in the indirect impact, we are having the food availability. Uh, climate change is having, indirect, as a, having a direct impact or you can say in the indirect impact on the agricultural production. Uh, if there is a decrease in the um, agricultural production, then the food availability will get harmed. And uh, with climate change, the quality of the food that we are getting from the crop land that is also changing. So we have a chance of malnutrition and that is an indirect effect of climate change. We have a potential effect on drinking water availability and again the drinking water quality also. If the drinking water, mainly the ground water, if it is going down, then it gets contaminated with several other minerals, which is not good for health. It increases the vector bone diseases and, of course, the poor ambient air quality. This shows the driving pathways for potential, driving forces of potential health impact. Okay, so uh, climate change, uh, as we know, that greenhouse gases uh, leads to climate change, as we have uh, mentioned earlier. This climate change leads to heat waves, extreme weather, increase in temperature, increase in precipitation. And uh, this regional weather changes leads to microbial contamination pathways, agroecosystem, hydrology, and different socioeconomic demographics. Regarding the health effects, of course, there is a climate, uh, uh, there are temperature related illness and death. If there is extreme temperature increase, you will uh, get the heat stroke and this may lead to death. And uh, there are extreme weather related heat, uh, health effects and vector borne diseases, effect on food and water shortage. And uh, of course, you will get some mental, uh, mental health related problem, nutritional problem, what is called the malnutrition. And uh, for to save uh, human health from the climate change effect, we need the research related to the specific health adaptation measures. This shows how the climate change affects uh, the vector bone diseases, how it can, uh, it, it can increase or decrease the vector bone diseases. Uh, climate change can affect the vector bone diseases in two ways. One, it can, uh, one with the increase in the temperature and with the increase in the habitat. Uh, vector bone diseases uh, are those diseases that is being uh, transformed from human to other being and 
uh, one part of the vector is the one part of the vector life cycle is uh, covered inside the uh, inside the body of the carrier and then it is been transmitted to another human and that human is get affected so for this one uh, that uh, vector or the insect need a habitat to grow itself so when the temperature rises the uh, mosquito mainly the vectors what we are talking about mosquitoes are mainly the insect that carry the vectors uh, are uh, their population increases with the rise in the temperature and uh, here the blue blue bucket symbol it is showing the habitat and the uh, uh, sun symbol it is showing the temperature so at every stages of the um, uh, of the growth, of the life cycle of the mosquito there is uh, if there is an increase in temperature there is there will be the increase in the larvae increase in the egg increase in the pup and in, again increase in the mosquito population and with the increase in the precipitation there will be the increase in the habitat of the mosquito uh, habitat for the mosquito growth uh, like if you have uh, there is some uh, uh, there is some some cases that where the water logging can happen in that areas uh, uh, water can be logged for some time and uh, mosquito population can breed there and a mosquito can breed within Three to four days. So, if a uh, if an if an area is having a water log for three to four days, it can be a very good habitat for mosquitoes. But on the other way, increasing temperature is having a negative effect on the mosquito population too. That means uh, the climate change is having one push effect for the mosquito population, and as well there is a pull effect of the mosquito population. This slide shows the impact of uh, climate change on agricultural activity agricultural activity can affect in several ways due to the climate change one the major driving pathway is the temperature if the temperature is rising uh, it may lead to drought condition it may reduce the water availability fresh water availability for the agricultural irrigation purpose and it will reduce the agricultural productivity again the glacier melting ultimately it will affect the irrigation with the less amount of availability of fresh water uh, with the increase in temperature there is uh, evidence that uh, wheat population will increase and this wheat population again affect the agricultural productivity climate change also affects the ozone depletion in the stratospheric ozone layer and this will lead to uh, the penetration of the ultraviolet radiation to the earth surface and the ultraviolet radiation will affect the agricultural productivity um, ultimately uh, if there is an air pollution um, this air pollution level is increasing particulate matter reduces the agricultural productivity and agricultural productivity if it is reducing it will have a negative impact on human health through mainly through malnutrition and the less availability of the food but apart from reducing the agricultural productivity the quality of the crop that is being produced through the crop plants that is also getting reduced with the climate change because when the climate change is happening the rainfall is increasing temperature is increasing then there is a runoff of the nutrients from the soil and this can reduce the uh, availability of different nutrients uh, in the crops and ultimately that will lead to the malnutrition in human health this shows the uh, potential effect of climate change on human health as i have already mentioned that uh, but uh, main impact of climate change is the heat related uh, heat related morbidity or mortality then related to the increase in the uh, pollution level atmosphere in increase in the um, ambient pollution level you will have the asthma respiratory allergies and airway related diseases there are increase in the vector borne or zootonic diseases like malaria yellow yellow fever virus chikungunya virus chika virus myora virus etc and these viruses can spread from one one place to another place and in that way it it can uh, it can be an epidemic in a particular area 
There are food borne diseases and nutrition. There are water borne diseases due to poor uh, water quality. Uh, there, there is an effect in the mental health and neurological diseases. And above all, there is social impact due to malnutrition, due to migration of people, due to climate change. And next. In India, climate change has a bigger impact. Simulation, these are two simulation graphs. The simulation graphs indicate all around warming associated with increase in the greenhouse gases in India. In India, there will be an 1.7 to 2 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, but in the western India, like towards Rajasthan. Um, uh, so, with the climate change, uh, the temperature will increase in the western India, and it shows that uh, the rainfall will also increase rainfall pattern will also change but uh, the rainfall pattern will change in a different direction than the weather that are than the uh, temperature temperature will increase mainly up to 3.5 degrees celsius uh, in the western part but the rainfall will increase mainly in the northeastern part and uh, the rainfall will deficit in the western part uh, this map shows the heat vulnerability index map for India. Here, for the preparation of this map, we have taken into consideration the temperature rise. We have taken into consideration the population of a particular district. Uh, then we have taken the ecological um, ecological uh, aspects, ecological effects of the temperature rise in a particular district, and we have prepared the heat vulnerability map for India. It shows that the central part of India, mainly uh, mainly the Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and part of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, this will be affect much with the heat, and this part is the main vulnerable part with increasing temperature and the heat. Uh, this shows the flood vulnerability map of India, and the most of the areas. Uh, to the flood vulnerable is in West Bengal, Punjab, and mainly in the uh, Gangetic, Gangetic Basin. Uh, this map is a this, this is a district level vulnerability map for agriculture. As I have already shown that uh, the western part of India is going to affect with the high temperature and low rainfall, and this shows that western western part of India is going to have. Um, is going to have the most vulnerable area for uh, with the climate change related to agricultural activity. And again, in the central part of India that I have shown in earlier slide that the heat vulnerability index is quite high in the central part of India. This effect, this is affecting here that the agricultural vulnerabilities will be also high in the central part of India. This shows the logistic level vulnerability map due to climate change in India. Um, as it was already shown that the temperature vulnerability will be high in the western part, and it will uh, and the rainfall will also less in the western part. So accordingly, the western part and the central part of India, all the districts in the central part and the western part of India will affect mainly due to the climate change. And for the preparedness, we have to take care. We have to be prepared for the climate change related activity related health effects. Or climate change related effect on the agricultural activities in these districts. I would like to conclude with the message that you have to protect yourself for climate change and protect your family. And hi, I uh, presentation to recover the pathways through which climate would affect health, especially through increasing temperature and uh, rainfall. And also showed many maps of India where the different parts of India how they would be affected by different aspects of climate change. We now move to whether uh, this, are, this was more of a theoretical uh, pathways, but now we need to look at whether there is actually an evidence that climate change is impacting health, whether globally or within India. And for doing that, we have Dr. Harshil Salve joining us now. He's an assistant professor at Center for Country Medicine at the All India School of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He has worked on several national and state health programs, and environmental health is one of his areas of interest. And he mentors and guides many students of country medicine uh, at AIMS. Till now, uh, we have discussed about the various pathways uh, through which climate change can affect the health. Now, we are going to talk about the few evidences about it. So, this is a familiar diagram to all epidemiologists. We call it as an epidemiological triad. 
So climate change actually affects all three factors at the agent, environment, and the host. At the agent, they affect the pathogen level, maturation, and the multiplication, as well as at the carrier or the vector level behavior. And at the environment, it affects the ambient temperature, heat waves, erratic rainfall, and contamination of the various environmental sources like drinking water sources. And at the host level, it affects the human behavior uh, in terms of crowding, displacement, and the migration. Also, due to uh, uh, impact of climate change on agriculture, it also has impact on the human nutrition. So that compromises sort of nutrition status of the uh, individual and that individual becomes susceptible for the various <coughs> infections. So now, com now coming to the global evidence, uh, there are various studies which has been carried out as far as the heat wave related mortalities are concerned. Uh, so if we compare, if we see the heat wave mortality, heat wave related all cause mortality, so in New York, it was observed that 6.5% increase during the heat wave. And in Australia, the heat wave related all cause mortality is more 37% in 15 to 64 years. And there is also evidence of uh, increase in 2.8% in, uh, in mortality with every uh, one degree Celsius increase in the heat wave intensity. Also, the impact uh, of the duration uh, for which the individual is exposed to the heat wave has also have uh, uh, attribution as far as the mortality is concerned. So, almost four per more than four percent increase in the all-cause mortality reported, and Mediterranean region uh, showed the increase in the mortality. There are also few factors which uh, contributed more to the all-cause mortality in the heat waves. That is confining to the bed, living alone. And also, more importantly, the person who were living on the top floor of the building reported 4.7% times a more all-cause related mortality. Coming to the uh, specific mortality, uh, so uh, as far as the cerebrovascular disease, the neurological disease concern in the Korea, three times increase in the mortality has been reported. And as far as the cardiovascular uh, diseases are concerned, so the odds ratio which was reported is 1.01 times, it's not much. But for respiratory disease, the 1.14 times in the China uh, the reported. Coming to the uh, extreme weather events, uh, in the recent time we have seen so many extreme weather events uh, happened uh, which are linked to the climate change. Uh, for example, flooding in 2010 in Pakistan, then summer in Russia in 130. Also, there was a heat wave reported, which is which attributes more than 70,000 excess deaths in the year 2003 in the euro. And it, it, they also estimated that researchers also estimated that more than 300 million population globally are at the risk of exacerbation of the asthma due to increased allergen level in the atmosphere due to the climate change. Now, coming to the other climate uh, sensitive infectious diseases. Uh, there are evidences available regarding uh, increase in Campylobacteriosis, Salmonella typhimurium, and Salmonella enteritis uh, due to, with the increase in the temperature. Also, the Plasmodium falciparum malaria epidemics reported in the Kenya uh, and decrease in the malaria cases in the Tanzania. So, it has both the impacts uh, in terms of increase in the vector borne disease and decrease uh, with respect to the uh, ecology of the vector. And also malaria zones in the uh, Kenyan uh, highlands were, were reported in more higher altitude region. Also tick-borne encephalitis zone has expanded as far as Sweden is concerned. And Lyme disease also uh, reported to be spread in northwest uh, in eastern Canada due to the climate change. And uh, due to the rise in sea level, there is a contamination of water with the microbes and the pesticides. So the chances of cancer also... Uh, increases. Coming to the mental health impacts, so it is majorly due to associate is associated with the rural and the urban displacement uh, and the mental health consequences. So mental, in Australia, the mental health impacts of following uh, of following nature were reported. First, the extreme stress, emotional injuries and despair, particularly in the children, which are more vulnerable for pre-disaster anxiety and the post-trauma illnesses. The long-term insecurity and the anxiety of my young people also reported uh, in the post-disaster uh, time. Coming to the conflicts and the migration, so El Nano uh, 
played a major role in the fifth of civil conflicts since 1950 and you you can see here the, the all research prove one thing that the climate change affects the more affected people so you have more premature deaths almost uh, 2 200000 per year increase in the premature deaths due to all these diseases which are climate sensitive diseases and out of these deaths 90% are occurring in the low and middle income country which are more vulnerable and that too 85% are in elderly and the under 5 years of age and also the who give also gives the similar estimates but there is also argument regarding the beneficial effect of climate change uh, so because of the rise in temperature the winter becomes mi- uh, milder so uh, the mortality due to influenza and the cardiovascular di- uh, uh, diseases actually uh, decreases in some temperate countries in the early phase of climate change also due to the higher temperature the area become more arid so mosquito population also decreases but you if you see the picture in total so overall impact of climate change on health is uh, on negative side now coming to the evidences from india this is the projections you can see here uh, over the next few decades there will be increase in the intensity of the heat wave increase in the duration and the frequency of more uh, warm days uh, which is estimated in india as uh, presented in the previous by previous presenter so due to uh, with the help of this heat vulnerability index there are almost 107 districts which we can categorize into a high and very high vulnerable district as far as uh, heat is concerned and if you see as, uh, if you compare the heat stroke with the other natural calamities so it ranks the third and almost more than 10000 deaths were caused by extreme high and low temperature between 1990 and march 2014 so it is uh, uh, some sort of ignored public health uh, problem we need to address coming to the specific mortality so with the increase in the temperature more than 40 degrees celsius uh, desai et al reported 11% increase in the mortality all cause mortality and the maximum effect was on mortality observed on the day 2 with the maximum temperature and the mortality due to ncds non communicable diseases increases by 1.5 per 7 uh, times during heat wave and main the mortality is reported more among the male as compared to females also among the people at their workplace particular labor furnace workers coming to the vector borne diseases so as uh, presented by the previous speaker the spatio temporal distribution of the vector borne diseases like malaria dengue and chikungunya is affecting due to the uh, climate change as far as malaria is concerned the uh, the colder states now going to see the extension of the transmission window of the malaria for a, an example other states uh, odisha andhra pradesh and tamil nadu will see the reduction in the transmission window so that has some impact in terms of uh, uh, making a intervention or some preventive strategy as far as national programs are concerned there are also emergence of the kala azar in the northern part of india and the reappearance of the chikungunya in the southern part are also linked to the climate change by the researchers as far as dengue is concerned so both uh, uh, in, in the northern states the increase in the transmission season as we are seeing currently in the ncr region and the last few years we have the more dengue cases just coming up and also uh, the researchers are trying to relate uh, the encephalitis syndrome and the j infection with the climatic variable in india but uh, the, uh, we need to take a holistic view with respect to the ecology and the epidemiology of vector borne diseases in order to have the comprehensive assessment of impact of climate change and vector borne diseases in india other uh, with respect to the chronic diseases the changes in the climate also affect the disease like copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease pneumothorax and uh, respiratory infection in the children but there is no direct evidence from india which is available however there is ample evidence regarding uh, linking air quality and the airway disease uh, from india to so the other diseases uh, as we have discussed so far the climate change is going to impact the crop yield by 4 to 50% and as we have the country with the children more than 40% of under five children under nursery so they are going to impact with Uh, this particular effect of the climate change and linkage between uh, climate change and diarrheal disease are still being explored as well as there is some uh, evidence available from india in terms of 
post tsunami mental stress and hyperglycemia particularly in the coastal population but again further research needs to be done this is a map which shows the extreme weather events so uh, uh, as per there is annual loss of almost uh, 9 to 10 uh, usd billion due to extreme weather events in india and uh, it also uh, the climate change impacts the changing frequency and the se severity of the extreme weather events now come to the last slide so uh, what are the scopes of further research in india with respect to the climate change and impact on health are concerned so basically we need to study the feasibility and the development of climate based early warning system at the prediction for the prediction of the vector borne diseases also there is need to establish direct linkage between airway disease cardiovascular disease and the climate change also there is need to assess the vulnerability and adaptive measures for the climate change for example community level vulnerability assessment climate resilient hospitals and the community level early warning system thank you so much thank you harshal and i hope you can stay with us and answer some queries at the end now that we are seeing uh, we pathways through which climate change affects health and clearly some evidence that health is being impacted currently because of the climate change it is time for us to down think about what is happening globally and in india to address these uh, climate change effects uh, climate change also came into um, limelight recently because of the actions of united states in working out a paris protocol but to discuss more about this global and and india specific we will now move to our next presenter unfortunately ms anuradha singh who was um, was supposed expected to join us from ministry of environment is not able to join us and we will now move to uh, ms suruchi budwal who will talk about both uh, on senda framework for disaster risk reduction as well as give us some uh, information on conference of the parties related to uh, un convention on climate change i request suruchi to please make the presentation suruchi is uh, focuses her research uh, which studies the impacts of vulnerability and adaptation to climate change she is currently a lead author in the special report of land on the ipcc she was a part of the working group on climate change and environment for the 12th five year plan and she has contributed as a lead author for the ipcc annual report 4 working group 2 has been a review editor for the ipcc r5 working group 2 report and the ipcc special report on extreme events thank you sir and uh, uh, the presentation uh, that i was asked to make was on the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and looking at the previous two presentations i think we are moving now from uh, science to policy and planning uh, when we talk about the sendai framework of course uh the linkages uh, have been mentioned in the sendai framework uh, with regards to climate change but uh, uh the reason why the sendai framework was uh, basically developed was uh, largely with a focus on disasters uh and keeping that in mind i think the entire uh, plan of action has been developed uh this basically uh, is a framework uh, which is being implemented by the un office uh for disaster reduction and whatever i have in the slides is actually straight uh from uh the un in terms of what the sendai framework focuses on uh the basics of the sendai framework uh are to do with uh you know uh when it was adopted uh in the third un world conference in march 2015 uh the framework basically focuses on a 15 year voluntary non binding agreement to focus on disaster risk reduction the period defined for the framework is from 2015 to 2030 uh this particular framework is a successor instrument to the yogo framework for action on disasters that was there earlier between 2005 to 2015 and the focus of the yogo framework was actually to build resilience of nations and communities to disasters it was adopted by 168 countries and today uh, what we see in the sendai framework which is uh, adopted after the yogo framework there are more than 180 countries who are party to the uh, current framework of action the chronology basically is uh, you know when uh, did uh, nations begin to think about having a framework around disasters 
the UN General Assembly basically passed a resolution uh, with the intent to uh, have a focus of 10 years from January 1990 onwards for a designated entity and focus um, and therefore declaring the 1990s as the international decade for natural disaster reduction. Uh, the focus of the uh, decade uh, being, uh, you know, focusing on disaster reductions, plus basically establishing a secretariat, which was the UN UNISTR, which was formulated in the uh, 90s, uh, followed by which there was a World Conference on, on Natural Disaster Reduction that was basically organized. And uh, this was basically to do an interim review of the international decade for natural disaster reduction, uh, which was uh, formulated some, somewhere in the early 90s. And in this particular conference of the UN, uh, uh, the Yokohama Strategy and Plan of Action for a Safer World was adopted. Uh, this was followed by a World Conference on Disaster Reduction in January 2005 in Kobe, uh, in which basically the Yogo Framework for Action was uh, adopted. Uh, you know, for a 10 year period from 2005 to 2015. Uh, as, as the Yogo framework ended in 2015, was another UN conference organized in 2015 basically to have a follow on to the Yogo framework, and the Sendai framework was adopted in 2015 in a meeting that was organized in Sendai, and the period uh, for which the Sendai framework is applicable now is from 2015 onwards to 2030. Uh, the venues of most of these conferences, if you see whether UN was organizing and having a discussion uh, in terms of focus on disaster risk reduction and uh, adoption of frameworks, have always been areas that have been hit by large disasters. And uh, they have had a strategy actually to hold these meetings in such locations to be able to give the importance and reference to disasters and the attention that disasters need in terms of action and policy and planning at possibly all levels of, uh, uh, of uh, decision making. Uh, the lessons learned and challenges from the yoga framework of action, uh, there were certain uh, positives because there was a 10 year period that was spent where countries, nations, etc did focus on some elements in terms of implementation that was outlaid in the Yogo framework. There's a claim that there has been a decrease in mortality in the case of some hazards during this period. Uh, countries have been able to enhance their capacities in disaster risk management over this period. Uh, I think many countries do now have a disaster management authority or cell within uh, uh, you know, uh, their uh, boundaries to be able to address uh, related issues and uh, manage related risks. Uh, so uh, this is basically being claimed as a development under the Yogo Framework of Action. Uh, international mechanisms for strategic advice, coordination and partnership development for disaster risk reduction, uh, and cooperation on these issues have increased over this period. Uh, there has been instrumental progress in the development of policies and strategies and advancement of knowledge and understanding surrounding these issues. And of course, there's been a lot in terms of sharing across different countries and mutual learning that uh, one has been able to achieve over this period. Uh, also, uh, what the Yogo framework basically claims is that there's been enough raising of awareness, both public and institutional during this period. And of course, there's been political commitment and uh, you know, which has helped in catalyzing actions around these issues involving a range of stakeholders for disaster risk reduction. So these are some of the achievements uh, that are visible and uh, basically are being uh, claimed uh, have been achieved during the past 10 to 12 years uh, as a result of the yoga action. But not to basically say that there are no challenges and of course, you know, that uh, uh, you know, there are gaps that we see uh, where basically there's still a lot to be achieved related to disaster risk reduction. Uh, while there has been progress on certain fronts, uh, we also realize that disasters have continued to exact a heavy toll. So in terms of the numbers and people affected and damage to life and property, these numbers have not gone down. And it may be because of various reasons, uh, if I were to say. Uh, about 700,000 people have lost their lives. About 1.4 million people have been injured uh, due to the disasters 
over this period uh, about 23 million people have been homeless as a result of uh, various events striking different parts of the world uh, more than 1.5 billion people have been affected by disasters and the economic loss worldwide has been to the tune of about 1.3 trillion dollars um, over this period it's not a small amount and uh, therefore that is the reason why continued action on disasters and disasters risk reduction has been a constant uh, a focus and call for attention in addition between 2008 and 2012 144 million people were displaced by disasters it's also a big cause of you know for temporary and permanent migration from certain parts of the world um it's also you know recognized in the uh, you know yoga framework that disasters are somewhere linked to climate change they are exacerbated because of climate change uh because uh, you know the frequencies intensities and the nature of these disasters are changing with the changing climate and therefore uh, you know these events um, are, have increased over time uh, then the na- the very nature has changed over time and therefore the impacts are likely to be far more greater than uh, ha- than having been experienced in the past um evidence also indicates that the exposure of persons and assets in all countries has increased faster than the rate at which we can address them and this is where i think somewhere you can link it to other global phenomenon like climate change because i think the rate at which these events have increased over the past and the intensities have changed has increased vulnerability of the people uh, and the exposure to these events uh, thus generating new risks and a steady rise in disaster related losses uh therefore in turn having implications at uh you know on the social uh aspects uh having implications on economic aspects and having implications on health culture and environmental related aspects uh these impacts are being felt both you know uh, at the short term the medium term and the long term uh, scales and they are being felt at the local community levels but of course when you actually scale this up uh, you know this kind of uh, you know uh, has implications at at the state level at a county level etc in terms of uh, you know uh, implications uh, on the gdp of the state and the country all countries especially developing countries where the mortality levels and economic losses are disproportionately higher are faced with increasing levels of possible hidden costs and challenges in order to meet financial and other obligations so uh, i think there are huge losses that basically we in, entail because of uh, you know uh, being uh, affected by various kinds of disasters globally nationally uh, regionally and locally Now, the sendai framework uh, basically had a focus of one global outcome uh one goal seven global targets 13 guiding principle four priorities for action and basically focusing all uh, these actions at four levels at the local level the national level the regional level and the global level with the involvement of uh, all possible stakeholders who matter in terms of taking action on disasters and also with a focus on inter- international cooperation and uh, partnerships at the global level which may help address uh you know response to these disasters the broad elements of the sendai framework uh basically are to do with disaster risk management uh you know compared to the yoga framework uh the focus is on risk management than just the disaster management uh the sendai framework basically uh, applies to risk of small scale and large scale frequent and infrequent uh, kind of disasters and sudden and slow onset disasters uh for the first time in the sendai framework was a recognition that the focus for on disasters would not be just for natural disasters but also man made disasters so therefore climate change and other kind of disasters which are influenced by anthropogenic activities also fall under this framework and of course uh, the management uh, basically aims to focus on a multi hazard management approach that basically you cannot look at a disaster as a uh, you know single uh, event but looking at uh, other factors surrounding it in terms of its focus this is a broad uh, structure of the framework that the sendai uh, framework 
uh, has adopted uh, the goal that I said, uh, the priorities for action, the four priorities for action, and the highlights of the framework. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I have the time to actually get into the details of this, but I think the presentation has been shared, and so you would uh, be having access to it. Very broadly speaking, there's a structure, there are highlights, and global targets that have been fixed. I think I will not get into the details of the goal, the outcome, but at least the targets that the, the Sendai framework has fixed, because that is what the whole framework focuses on. The objective is to substantially reduce uh, global disaster-related mortality by 2030, aiming to lower average per 1 lakh global mortality rate in the decade 2020 to 2030 compared to the period 2005 to 2015, reduce the number of affected people, so the numbers are written over there, reduce the direct disaster-related economic losses uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the losses to GDP, um, reduce disaster damage to infrastructure, including health and educational facilities, uh, you know, so by 2030, so they have their own targets over there, and of course, reduce the number of countries which are affected by disasters, enhance international cooperation related to these issues, and basically, uh, you know, focus on uh, a multi-hazard related approach in terms of dealing with disasters. So uh, this was related to the Sendai framework, and I would move on to the uh, to the discussion related to the uh, UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, which was formulated in 1992. Uh, basically, with the objective to uh, to have a you know a framework of action around climate change, uh, and uh, so it's a very introductory presentation because uh, uh, this was something just came up at the last minute. Uh, uh, I think uh, you know uh, basically saying uh, what the UNF Triple C is all about and a little mention of the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement uh, and some definitions surrounding the uh, Framework Convention. Uh, as I said, this was basically uh, formulated in 1992 uh, uh, with the objective of addressing critical issues surrounding uh, climate change. Uh, it pr provides a foundation for all policy and action related to climate change. Uh, you could go to the uh, uh, provided links to, uh, you know, uh, uh, read on more details related to the framework convention. The basics is basically the uh, convention lays out a broad statement of principles and objectives related to climate change. And the ultimate objective of the framework convention is basically to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So that is the ultimate objective uh, with regards to which the whole principles have been outlaid. Uh, there are four broad principles by which the uh, Framework Convention abides, uh, and these are related to global equity, global efficiency, the precautionary principle of uh, addressing climate change, and common but differentiated responsibilities, recognizing that there are different uh, capacities of nations to be able to address climate change in a differential manner. Uh, there are different types of countries within uh, the world, uh, and they've been categorized uh, accordingly to be, you know, basically when issues are raised around climate change. First and foremost are the Annex 1 parties. These are the developed countries, so-called developed countries and the industrialized countries, which have a certain role defined under the Framework Convention in terms of what they need to do as a priority compared to developing countries, least developed countries and other parties in the world. Annex 2 parties are, consist of OECD members, but they are not in the group of Annex 1 countries. These are countries who are in the progression towards Annex 1 status, which is developed status, and therefore they have been categorized separately and they have a certain role, different role to play in terms of what they need to address within the uh, ambit of the Framework Convention. And non-Annex 1 parties are largely developing countries. There's been a history of how the negotiations have developed over the years, starting from 1992, which is the Rio summit. And over a period of time, there have been uh, several meetings held annually to be able to progress discussions and also negotiations on various issues related to climate change. The first conference of parties was basically held in Berlin 
where the Berlin Mandate had been adopted, uh, following which uh, in Kyoto, uh, landmark uh, events that I'm just mentioning, uh, which have occurred over this period of time, uh, in Kyoto, in COP3, in Japan, was the Kyoto Protocol adopted, which basically uh, put forward certain uh, certain targets which were required to be met by countries to be able to achieve uh, global goals uh, and address climate change. Uh, uh, in 2002, uh, we had 10 years completed uh, uh, and the World Summit, uh, the Rio Plus 10 Summit that was organized, um, and there were critical decisions also taken during that summit related to progress on work related to climate change. The first meeting of the parties of uh, the Kyoto Protocol was held in 2005 because that was a period when the Kyoto Protocol was ratified by uh, world leaders and uh, globally. And uh, so uh, post-2005, uh, did we start having both the COP meetings and the meeting of the parties because, uh, you know, the Kyoto Protocol had come into action. And off late, we are in the second phase of uh, our agreement uh, post the Kyoto Protocol. The Paris Agreement had been signed in 2000, ratified in 2016. Uh, basically, uh, this is just what the Kyoto Protocol was aiming to achieve. It was aiming to basically have Annex 1 parties commit to binding targets to limit and reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, these targets, uh, while uh, the ambition was to make them legally binding, were non, uh, not legal, legally bound. And uh, basically, uh, it was a statement of interest in terms of countries committing to action related to reduction of greenhouse gases. Uh, in terms of uh, the Paris Agreement and beyond, uh, countries have uh, declared their nationally determined contributions uh, with actions, uh, you know, outlined both for mitigation and adaptation. They have uh, indicated their interest in terms of uh, developing the national adaptation plans, uh, as well as uh, de defining the national climate strategies uh, that are to be impl implemented, whether with internal funds or with support from external sources. And of course, also declaring uh, their levels of ambition in taking action in related areas. Uh, there has also been mention of uh, linking it to the Sustainable Development Goals and to see how uh, basically some of these actions that are being reported can be linked to other international frameworks that are being talked about. Um, the COP is a conference of parties to the UNFCCC. The MOP, as told earlier, is a meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol. And right now we are in the process of holding both COPs and MOPs because both these processes have already been set into place. These are different groupings in, at the COP meetings that uh, we see normally. There's a group of 77 and China, which comprises mostly of developing countries. There's an alliance of small India states, the AOSIS group, which is basically consisting of 43 low-lying and small island countries who come forward and have their own negotiations on certain issues that matter to island nations. There's a group of 48 countries which comprise the least developed countries. There's a group of European Union, the Umbrella Group, which is largely the developed country group, and then a group on environmental integrity that basically comes with its own sets of issues. There are observer organizations who participate in the COP meetings and the MOP meetings. These are largely NGOs and other kind of intergovernmental organizations who participate and are provided a space and a voice of their own to reflect on various issues, which basically influence the negotiations here during the COP meetings. So in a nutshell, there are about 750 NGOs plus who are <coughs> registered and uh, 56 IGOs are admitted as uh, observers. Uh, the role of the NGOs, as I already have mentioned, is basically to uh, steer uh, the negotiations in a certain direction given the issues uh, uh, that are highlighted. Uh, environmental NGOs basically uh, have a certain role to play over there, uh, and this includes organizations like Terry who are actually registered uh, to highlight issues uh, that are of prominence uh, during that period which one, you know, as an environmental NGO, one would like to get highlighted in the negotiating sphere. And so that is the role that most organizations play while they are there at the COP meetings to be able to kind of influence uh, policy and decision making around the negotiations happening around climate change issues. 
and with that i would basically uh, uh leave it here i think i have some acronym here maybe people are familiar with it but i would just close over here thank you suruchi uh, for your presentation i request all of you to join the next webinar which will focus on how we can do studies which link uh, environmental issues as well as with with health issues like malaria and dengue so we look forward to seeing you there and uh, we are already beyond the time so we'd be now closing